Hello and welcome to part four of this PFAS identification series. Today's episode is on internal standards for PFAS, something that is very, very important to PFAS analysis, even more so than it is to other compound classes. Um, this is pretty specific information. If you're looking for more basic PFAS information, I have another series just on the background and history and chemical properties. This is very specific to if you want to analyze PFAS, how do you do it? So just getting started, PFAS internal standards, correcting your data. Um, this is to achieve the highest quality data and to eliminate a few of the biases that you would see with this type of analysis. So the three things correct for binding, I mentioned in the previous episode, PFAS tend to bind to things like plastic and glass. Um, internal standards will too, so we correct for that. You wanna correct for other analytical bias, such as instrument response, um, changes in temperatures or pressures or what may affect your, your instrument and correction for differences in volume. So if your um, volumes or pipetting is slightly off, internal standards will correct for that because it they will be off by the same degree as your uh, analytes. So what are internal standards? Um, we use for PFAS what we call stable isotope labeled standards. The stable isotope we usually use is carbon-13. So we're pretty much synthesizing the same molecules, but with a few or all of the carbons replaced with carbon-13. Um, this is really handy because the new compounds retain the same chemical properties. So here we have our P-phosphorus. Um, it's the P-phosphorino that you've seen in previous episodes, um, both in its native form, so that's in its natural form, and in its uh, 13C8 form. So that means all eight of the carbons in its structure have been replaced with 13C, so that it's heavier. Its weight would be plus eight of the normal carbon. So even though it's a bit heavier, the chemical properties are the same, it's gonna behave the same, but since we use mass spectrometry to determine these, it has a different mass, so we'll be able to tell them apart. So like the example I used yesterday for sample prep with drinking water samples, um, I added to this slide, I added the actual internal standard, which here we'll be using, as you'll see later, an isotope dilution internal standard or a surrogate standard because we've added it before extraction. But you can see the little yellow P phosphoruses now. We've added them to our sample and now they're gonna be carried through the extraction um, the exactly, in, in exactly the same way as the native analytes. So we're gonna rinse out the other nasty stuff here here. Um, and then if we have, this is what I didn't add to the previous slide in the previous talk, but you may have some PFAS still bound to the bottle in there. Hopefully your methanol rinse will rinse that out, but even if it doesn't, the ratio of native PFAS is going to be the same as the ratio of native PFAS um, to the internal standard in your sample is gonna be unchanged. So if you lose some of one, you'll lose the same proportion of the other. That's kind of how this works. That's kind of how that correction works. Um, the other thing it does is internal standards, once we get to our analytical techniques, and I haven't really covered analytical techniques yet, but we're using electrospray mass spectrometry, which if you look at the words, you can probably figure out electro spray. So we put an electric charge and make a tiny spray. Mass spectrometry, meaning we measure the mass. So during this spray, you can have lots of variations in um, uh, sample ionization. So how does the how did those PFAS get into your instrument? Um, and you'll you'll always lose some in your spray. The idea though is anything you lose, anything that's degraded, anything that makes it in or doesn't make it in, it's always gonna be the same proportion of internal standard to native standard. So by measuring the ratio, um, it, it's a much, more imp, uh, a much more valid way to do it because um, we're correcting for any losses immediately. So you don't even have to correct your data, it's kind of automatically done if what you measure is the ratio of these two rather than um, just the response of the native analyte. So there's three main types of internal standards. There are surrogate internal standards, isotope dilution internal standards, and what a lot of people just call internal standards, but some people call injection internal standards. So I'm gonna go through these three main types of internal standards. First of all are the surrogate and isotope dilution standards. I did these first because they're kind of similar in the fact that they're both added before sample extraction. So you add these to your sample bottle or you add them to your soil or serum or whatever it is you're analyzing. Um, so like I mentioned in the previous example, they're carried out through the entire extraction. 
So the surrogate, the difference between these two are that surrogates are measured and reported independently. So you're actually measuring the surrogate and reporting how much you recovered versus an isotope dilution internal standard. You're, you're not really measuring it. You're using it to correct for the native PFAS. So this is what you're doing to make like a response ratio between this and the native PFAS. So how that works is that in a sample, um, the ratio of native to isotope dilution standard is going to be the same um, in a similar concentration uh, for an analytical standard. So if in an analytical standard, analytical standard is something you've prepared as a comparison, right? It's a known amount. So in this analytical standard, we have 10 parts of our P-phosphorus and I counted them out. They should be right. Um, 10 parts of our P-phosphorus and then 10 parts of our isotope dilution P-phosphorus. So this is our 13C labeled. Um, so the ratio is one to one in a 10 PPT analytical standard. So if you look at a sample and you measure a response of four for your P-phosphorus and a response of eight for your isotope dilution, um, you know that your isotope dilution should be 10, but it's eight. That means you lost two, you lost 20% during your extraction. So that's fine to lose 20%. Most methods allow that. Um, but the, we would use this ratio though to automatically correct our native value. So because we have four, um, it actually means we lost some of those too, right? So we only have eight of the isotope dilution out of 10. So how many out of that four should we have? And you do the math, so 10 divided by 8, 1.25. Um, so it's meaning that uh, we got like a 25% loss in recovery. Um, so if we multiply 4 times 1.25, our answer comes out as 5. So that, that 4 that we measured, we can correct it to 5 because we know that we had loss of recovery. That's kind of how isotope dilution works. Um, you don't have to physically do that calculation since we're always measuring the ratio. It's automatically done, but that's, that's kind of the correction that, that works practically. With internal standards, um, they're very similar because they would both, they would like the previous ones, they would be something labeled or something similar like a 13C. Um, but instead of being added like the other two before sample preparation, they're added to your final extract after sample preparation. Um, and so that this can perform multiple roles. So the internal standard can be used to measure how much surrogate or how much uh, isotope dilution standard you actually lost during the extraction. Since it's added after extraction, it only accounts for things like instrumental bias, not um, through the sample prep. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Or you can just quantify your entire suite of native compounds instead of using an isotope dilution. You can just quantify them on an internal standard. That's called the internal standard quantitation method. That's what's used in method 537. Um, so 537 would look like this with natives on top and then your internal standards on the bottom. Uh, this is very similar math to what we did before with the isotope dilution standards. Um, you see on the left, our 10 PPT analytical standard, we have it at a one to one ratio with our internal standard. But again, on the right, we only have eight. So we again have that, um, that lost recovery. So we need to correct that two and 10 over eight being 1.25, that two gets corrected to 2.5. Um, so that uh, will correct our data and will um, improve our analysis. It obviously, Two is not the same as 2.5. Um, the limit for reporting might be 2.2, so that we've, we've now reported something we couldn't before. Um, that's kind of how internal standards work. And so I mentioned before, what methods are these in? So surrogates and internal standards are used in method 537 for drinking water, whereas isotope dilution standards and internal standards are used in method 533. 533, doing it this way, isotope dilution is always better. The data is automatically corrected, so it's gonna be better data. And um, method 533 is superior in a lot of ways. It's a much newer method. It's only in the last year, 2019, whereas 537 has been around I forget exactly, but it's been around for years longer. 
Hey, so that's PFAS internal standards. Um, we add them before, after extraction, um, and then we measure with our instrumentation to make sure everything went well and to correct our data. Um, they're very important because they correct for all the difficult parts of PFAS, like the fact that they bind everywhere. Um, so I hope you enjoyed. Um, stay tuned for next time. We're gonna talk a little bit about managing your standards and um, your calibration standards on the instrument and some do's and don'ts and tips and tricks for that. So thanks for joining. Bye.